Uh, my name is Josh Greenberg. I'm the Associate Director of the School of Journalism and Communication. And I speak for my colleagues when I say that we're thrilled to present Professor Jack Halberstam from the University of Southern California as our distinguished speaker. Professor Halberstam joins a prominent group of international scholars who have headlined this lecture in the past. Toby Miller, Lisa Parks, Lisa Nakamura, Gabriella Coleman, and Andrew Chadwick. This is an eclectic group whose respective records of scholarship deal with a broad range of topics and intellectual concerns, from the so-called death of television to the rise of the hacker collective Anonymous, neglected discourses in online games, satellite images of declassified bomb sites, and hybrid media systems. Professor Halberstam's talk, Queer Gaming, Glitches, and Going Turbo, will expand the Atala Lecture's theoretical and topical terrain and continues a tradition of presenting stimulating and thought-provoking arguments about a core idea or set of ideas and issues in communication. Uh, tonight's event is one of many that are being held this month uh, during the Faculty of Public Affairs Research Month. Uh, we're pleased to be hosting this year's Atala Lecture here in the River Building, uh, which houses our school and its programs. Uh, the space has been generously provided by our Dean Andre Pluard, who's in attendance this evening. Uh, thank you, Dean Pluard, for your leadership in bringing Research Month to fruition and for your support of the Atala Lecture. And to Associate Dean Karen Schwartz, who played a key role in organizing these events, uh, and to a number of staff in the Office of the Dean, uh, notably Pierre Hamill and Karen Adma, who've been working tirelessly on the scheduling end of things. Another important event during FPA Research Month is our own graduate student conference, now in its ninth year. Uh, we're pleased to once again host the Atala Lecture in conjunction with the conference which began today and ends tomorrow. The conference organizing team, along with the entire Graduate Student Caucus and its executive, deserve high praise for putting together an excellent event, which has attracted several top-notch graduate students in communication from across Canada, and it's great to see so many of them in attendance this evening. I'm one of a small number of faculty members in our school who were recruited to Carleton during the Paul Atala era. Paul was the associate director when I was hired uh, 10 years ago to this month. It's a position he held for 12 years, making him the longest serving associate director in the school's history. Paul had a sharp wit, and he was a gifted scholar. He was a remarkable teacher and a spirited interlocutor who savored a good conversation. Paul never shied away from a debate, as far as I know, and was always curious about why people hold the views that they do. And he wasn't afraid to push you to explain yourself. The main focus of Paul's research was television, in particular American network TV. As our colleague Michael Dorlin wrote, network television represented for Paul a successful, if complex, model of the relationship between a media technology, domestic space, and its inhabitants, the audience and an ethos he termed fun. It was, Michael writes, the utter lack of fun of the Canadian media context, its pompous seriousness, that drove Paul to some famous vits, fits of vitriolic contempt. <laughs> a cancer took Paul from his family, friends, colleagues, and students too soon, and we're grateful to his family for providing the endowment that allows us to honor Paul with this annual lecture. I want to reflect a bit more on this ethos of fun because it's a fitting place to begin my introduction of our speaker. Jack Halberstam's recent book, Gaga Feminism, Sex, Gender, and the End of Normal, it takes Lady Gaga as a symbol of how the world has changed with regards to gender, sexuality, desire, and the politics of publicity. While it may be tempting to dismiss Lady Gaga as little more than a corporate action figure in the flesh, Professor Halberstam convincingly argues that if we suspend such assumptions and instead take Gaga seriously, then we have the opportunity to explore and rethink some of the central ways in which everyday culture establishes normative codes about sex, gender, and socialization that discipline and constrain behavior and reproduce existing relations in systems of power and domination. Combining so-called low theory with its concern for the popular with the high theory of critical feminist thought, the book celebrates the carnivalesque ways in which Lady Gaga unleashes what Professor Halberstam describes as representational mayhem on the world. The book concludes with a manifesto calling for a politics of performance in which going Gaga amounts to a repertoire of resistance strategies, blocking, slowing, jamming the, social, jamming the economy and the social stability that depends upon it. 
It calls for a questioning of the status quo, but refuses to offer anything more than the promise that things could be different. Gaga feminism extends a line of argument developed in Professor Halberstam's earlier book, The Queer Art of Failure. Here too, we have a number of fun and accessible texts. Pixar movies like Finding Nemo, Toy Story, and Over the Hedge, all favorites in my house. To bumbling male buddy stoner flicks like Dude, Where's My Car? a favorite of some of my friends. Uh, <laughs> Professor Halberstam subjects these films to queer subversive readings as a way of theorizing about failure and to encourage us to think about how the ideological structures of North American society condition how we understand and perform sexed and gendered identities, how they shape childhood socialization and the politics that flow from such projects and performances. The book explores how low culture, popular films and media we might otherwise dismiss as silly or childish contain critiques of a culture that rewards obedience and marginalizes those who do not fit the mold of what we might call normal. This evening's talk revisits and I think expands on some of these earlier arguments, reflecting on the animated genre of children's films that begin with Toy Story, but include movies like Over the Hedge, B-Movie, the claymation film Chicken Run. Professor Halberstam argues that CGI technology changed the face of animation, not simply because we shifted from 2D to 3D, but because the shift from analog to digital made other stories, relations, and outcomes possible. If animated worlds featured large animals chasing small ones across a flat and passive landscape, after Toy Story, the world of objects took on a new, more dynamic, and unpredictable dimension that affords potentially new narratives for living in late capitalist society. Tonight, Professor Halberstam explores this dimension with us in relation to games and asks us what kinds of new stories emerge from shifts in the codes and algorithm, algorithms in these worlds. Jack Halberstam is a full professor of American Studies and Ethnicity, Comparative Literature and Gender Studies at the University of Southern California. In addition to The Queer Art of Failure and Gaga Feminism, Professor Halberstam is the author of three other books and numerous chapters and articles addressing an array of topics spanning such issues in uh, uh, terrain as cultural studies, queer theory, visual culture, popular culture, and gender studies. Uh, we're very pleased that Jack has made the trip to Ottawa and is available to join us and deliver this year's Atala lecture. Professor Jack Halberstam. Wow, well, thank you for that uh, fantastic uh, introduction. I am absolutely honored uh, and delighted to be here to join you. Um, and um, yes, fun is definitely my key word uh, for the night. And uh, we'll have some fun, I think, but we'll also try to explore some of the questions that come up um, around queerness, the coding of queerness and the coding of identity in relationship to the evolving realm of gaming. Um, but before I jump into the gaming, I do want to say something about screens because you know we're going to be looking at lots of different, basically, screens as we go through the talk. But I was thinking about the topic of the conference when I went to see the um, Spike Jones film the other week, Her, right? Do you, did you notice how the screen was kind of absent? It was literally gone, like the, the mediation that the screen offers that we're so cathected to, that we feel is completely uh, indispensable, was suddenly gone and he had the little thing in his ear and it was, it was all sound all the time. Um, I thought that was interesting and something that we might want to be thinking about, about ever more invisible forms of mediation and then the shift to the oral. A lot of what we're gonna talk about in relationship to gaming, gaming comes to us through screens on the one hand, but on the other hand comes through writing. And writing is you, you know, a, a, a very dense field of mediation. And what the film wanted to suggest to us seemingly was that the voice was a less dense field of ma mediation and one that would allow us therefore to ignore the fact that there is no human body even attached to the voice such that someone can actually fall in love with a presence that is without a body, okay? So I wonder about the dominance of visuality and whether we're at its absolute peak with all of our screens. I noticed this, for example, in relationship to the, the iPhones and the smartphones. They can't decide whether the screen should be bigger or smaller. Have you noticed? 
like the so Apple keeps going back and forth because Samsung comes out with bigger screens and then people seem to like that they can do more on it. So there's an, it's unclear. Do we want more screen? Do we want less, less screen? Are we more invested in the screen as we move from the age of cinema into the age of digital media? Or are we more invested? Do we just have more screens? Or are we actually dispensing with the screen? Um, there are certain artists who have made it their project to begin to explore soundscapes. Uh, Sharon Hayes is a very good example. She's a queer artist who often uses sound to fill public spaces and alter the kinds of relationships that occur there. I just saw um, a show by Nick Cave in Boston, and he creates these sound suits. Uh, and I think wearable media it, you know, is a new thing. There was somebody at the Oscars the other night who was looking at his watch, and, and he was like, you know, I can read my email on here, I can watch a movie, I can, and he's like, but do you want to? You know, like, is this really like, oh, fun, I'm gonna watch a movie now. I don't. You know, some of these things look good in James Bond, and then you actually get to the point where that technology is available less good, right? So I'm interested in, you know, what kind of future we imagine for screens. Uh, and so I want to take seriously the topic of your conference, even as some of what I will present tonight uh, seems to sort of um, skirt that topic. But all of what I present comes courtesy of some uh, version or another of a screen. So I have um, basically four sections um, that I'm going to go through with you, and they're, they're peppered with little media clips and sound clips and so on. Um, I want to begin by thinking about what queer gaming might be. Queer gaming uh, is queerness like now you add some lesbian and gay characters to Grand Theft Auto so that you can be mugged by a lesbian rather than just, <laughs> you know. It, it, is that what we mean by queer gaming? or? Are we much more sophisticated than that and we need to think about codes? And if we need to think about codes, on what level do we need to think about codes in order to shift the normativity of the world of gaming? And we all are sort of aware of the fact that the world of gaming is pretty normative. We, are, we all have sort of twitchy little white boys in our minds when we're thinking about gaming, right? They're all there, you know, playing or they're doing some version of Dungeons and Dragons at uh, some really bad, nerdy role-playing game, right? What would it mean for these worlds to be queer? Um, and I'll get into that in, uh, in a moment. Then um, I'm actually going to give you an example of a film about a game. Uh, so we get into this sort of meta realm, a discussion of game within film. Um, then I'll talk to you a little bit about queer, queer technology will be section three. And then at the end, I'll, I'll talk about this concept of going turbo and connect it with um, the concept of the glitch. And you all know what glitches are. I mean, they, they happen much more uh, often than we would like. Um, but I was recently at a university where someone had created a, an art project called the Art of the Glitch. And the way that he described the glitch was as a kind of wilderness within the computer, a, a space that opens up and that is unmappable and unchartable. It's a, that's a little romantic, but I really like the idea of the glitch as somebody who's very deeply invested in failure and in productive uh, failure. The glitch is when the program fails. Um, when the system fails, you end up with a glitch. Now, the idea then is not to see the glitch as something that's getting in the way of what you want to do, but actually thinking of the aesthetic that is produced by the glitch, okay? And I think I, I may even have an image of that, do I? No, I don't. Um, okay, so I have an image later on of a screen, like the, the, the bits, the combination of the bits actually produce very, very interesting materials when the glitch occurs that we should read as aesthetically rather than just trying to get it off the screen, okay? So we might be bypassing in our zeal to play the game and to follow through on a trajectory, we might be actually missing the aesthetic of the game itself, which is very often located in the bits and pieces that are in between the game. Okay, so the glitch would represent some of those bridges, whether they were supposed to be there or not, uh, that might, if we slow down, catch our attention and be giving us different information than the information that's given to us when we actually play the game. Okay? Now, I actually um, wrote a version of this paper for a conference I was invited to uh, at Berkeley on queer gaming. And uh, it was a really cool conference. It was in November. Um, and it combined people who design games with people who, you know, academics who think about games but may or may not play them, 
um, and then activists who use games to make interventions into the public realm. It was a fabulous conference. Um, there were a couple of things that really stood out. First, who knew how many programmers, how many game designers were transgender women? You may not know that, but there is a huge presence of trans women in the gaming world, and that definitely has an impact in the way in which certain kinds of characters uh, are drawn. Um, the other thing was, I, I actually thought the conversations back and forth between the game makers, the artists, and the academics were really uh, amazing. And those are the kinds of conversations that I think one wants to create a platform for, rather than just sit here and uh, kind of uh, theorize in the absence of thinking about how the games uh, develop. So let's, um, one of the, th I, I said when they invited me to this conference, I was like, eh, I don't really play games, which probably is horrifying to some people here when you're like, okay, you're going to talk to us about games and you don't really play them. Uh, no, uh, I don't really <laughs> play a lot of games. I'll tell you about what happened when I did play games um, in the not so distant uh, past. But, but I, my, the person who invited me said, I'd like to encourage you to think about games in relationship to the work that you've done on animation, which Josh alluded to. And so I, I do actually want to begin by thinking about this uh, transition. One of the arguments that I made in relationship to animation is that everything that happens in these new CGI animations happens at the level of the algorithm. And the algorithm is really the, 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 the bit, the, the section of innovation that one should be paying attention to, a little bit like uh, the glitch. So in Finding Nemo, for example, it's not just that you get a lot of queer characters, which you do get, actually, but the algorithm that was so crucial to Finding Nemo and its success is the algorithm that allows you to render light on water. That was the big innovation of Finding Nemo. You have a realistic world in Finding Nemo because they finally figured out how to animate light through water. Monsters, Inc., how to animate hair, which was not possible before. In A Bug's Life, how to animate the crowd. So you could have multiple insects that are not the same insect drawn over and over and over again, but is actually a mass drawn in all of its complexity and its individuality. Those algorithms are what create CGI and make it very different uh, from the linear uh, animation that comes before it. And I'll, I'll have a little thing about that in a moment. So let me start with a clip then that brings together the games and the animation. And this comes from um, a, a little show that I was introduced to that I adore called Adventure Time. Does anyone watch Adventure Time? There are really wacky characters in Adventure Time that are not exactly human and not exactly animal and not exactly machine. And I really love that uh, about this uh, animated uh, um, series. And there's a little character called Bimo, and I want to introduce you to Bimo. Uh-oh. Oh! What's on the menu, Bimo? I've created... I'll, get, uh, I'll make sure you get the whole thing. Who wants to play video games? Bimo! Bimo! What's on the menu, Bimo? I've created a new game called Conversation Parade. Start it <laughs> up, right. Bimo! What do you think about the stars in the sky? It's okay, I guess. Yeah, they're cool. That is an interesting response. Better low, shut down. Boo. Bimo, that was weak. What now? Okay, so you got Beavis and Butthead who want to play video games, right? They're Jake and Finn, I think they're actually called. They want to play video games, but Bimo's like, okay, let's play a game. It's a, we're going to have a conversation. And they're like, oh, hell no, we're not having a conversation. That's super boring. So, but it's a reminder that what a game is is not so different from a lot of other forms of human interaction. And I, I sort of like uh, uh, that, that reminder um, here. The other thing that's really cool here is what is BMO? What is BMO? And BMO is sort of a combination of a game console, a VCR, an alarm clock, a toaster, and so on. Um, and in that sense, he sort of captures one way that we might think about the queerness of this little creature is that his form resides in its function. What is he depends upon uh, what he does. So I just want to um, uh, continue. There he is. He's like this weird little hybrid creature. He's an old Macintosh. 
uh, is he a console? Is he a Game Boy? There's actually a whole episode where he wants to be a human boy and he's not able to. It's very tragic and, uh, and so on. So I want to finish this thought um, about uh, animation here. So as uh, Josh was saying, in my previous work on animation, I made this argument that CGI completely changes uh, the face of animation, not just because we shift from 2D to 3D, because in fact, many people can't even register uh, that shift, but because the shift from analog to digital, from linear to fractal, makes other stories uh, possible. And the point that Josh made about linear is very easily conveyed to you by simply remembering what cartoons used to be. And it really was a large character chasing a small character uh, across an unmoving uh, landscape. And you could put Sylvester and Tweety in there. So what changes when you get 3G is that the camera has a point of view within the realm of the cartoon itself. And so many different perspectives are possible. And an entire world comes to life so that it isn't simply two characters in a loopy narrative. Uh, there are many, many other stories that become available. And as I said, as these new algorithms appear, different kinds of stories uh, can be told. Okay, let's see where we go next. All right, so um, what kinds of uh, uh, stories uh, emerge from shifts in the codes and algorithms in gaming worlds? So I'm going to warn you in advance that I don't know the answer to this question. But what I want to do here today is explore with you the questions that we might ask. And I'll ask those questions in a moment. And then hopefully towards the end of the uh, talk, we'll have a few answers um, in place at least. Obviously, we're also interested in what queer theory, what gaming has to offer queer studies, but also what queer theory may have to offer gaming in terms of a critique of the normative, the predictable, the stable, the thinkable, and I would say an embrace of the ludic and the loopy. Um, and also think about Toy Story as a, a, a beautiful little cartoon because it's really about the relationship between objects absent the human. And I think that a lot of game worlds try to make you believe that you've entered into another world where you are uh, extraneous to that world. And the real relationship is between uh, the non-human objects. All right, as promised, I will give you my sad little story about when I played uh, video games. Um, and of course, playing with toys is different from playing a game, and so I, I want to mark that distinction as well. Oh, that's just the, the poster. Uh, to say that there is a large community of people who are super interested not only in queering gaming, but queering the tech too. And that's one of my points about BMO, is that it's the hardware as well as the software. It's the object, the toy, as well as the program that has to be queered, okay? So we, we tend to focus a lot on the software. What about the hardware as well, the to literally the toy, the tech? Um, how would we queer that material? All right. Uh, and I have, I hope, given you this, uh, the argument about queer algorithms. So obviously I'm not arguing that we just need gay and lesbian characters in games. I'm arguing that we need to recode what we mean by sexuality and gender. And while that's very hard to do across human bodies, isn't it something that we could think of doing within a game or within a computer program, right? So if you can't recode how we read each other and how we read bodies, could we come up with a game within which we had completely redistributed the meaning of gender, the meaning of embodiment, the meaning of desire? And if we can't, what does that say about ideology? Why is it so difficult to imagine things uh, very, very differently? The algorithm is a way of beginning this conversation uh, about coding. All right. All right, so the game that I played that I was so bad at, I mean, even the fact that it's The Sims, you're probably like, oh, that's pathetic, right? Um, how many years ago? Yeah, that's what happened. So I was, I was really interested in gaming. I missed, uh, you know, I'm too old to have uh, been around, to be young enough um, when the really, really fun games were around. So by the time I had a little bit of time on my hands and enough cash to go and buy a game, it was The Sims, okay? But some people here probably still play Sims. Do you guys still play Sims? Yeah, right? But now it's with people instead. This was when there were no people. You just had these cities. But it appealed to my sense of, you know, authoritarianism probably, that 
I wanted to control the world. I had a kind of utopian fantasy that my SimCity would be amazing, everyone would be happy, the roads would be fixed, the schools would be open, the parks would be blooming. Well, it actually, my world went downhill really quickly. I probably had the record for creating nuclear disaster, is my guess. Um, and it, it was really frustrating to me because there was something about the game that completely eluded me. I do feel that once the game began to be played with sim people, I understood that there was a normativity coded even into SimCity when the people weren't there, and that there was something about the normativity that I was refusing. I mean, that's the narrative I'm telling myself for why my city went into ruin. But it is a nice illustration of the fact that you cannot just change the surface of a game. You actually would have to change its entire core, its coded core, in order to make it do uh, something different. I believe that when the Sim people entered into uh, the Sims game, we saw what the game was really about. And what the game was really about was ordering space according to predetermined, understood norms of intimacy, space, housing, habitation, interaction, relation, and so on. And all of that normativity was hidden when it was just Sim City and comes out when it's those Sim people. And adding a couple of gay men doesn't make it any better. Like, look at Modern Family or, you know, uh, any of these new, the new normal uh, uh, TV shows. Okay, so that was my um, little sad experience um, uh, playing games. So what I want to do, though, is use um, my failure to play these games, which hasn't um, assuaged my interest in, in games. I'm still very, very interested in them. I want to use some of the work that I've done on Gaga feminism, which is rethinking the politics of uh, gender in an era when sex and gender have changed radically in, in the last decade. I want to combine it with some of the work that I've done on failure to ask, I hope, some different kinds of questions about gaming and teching and the relationship between queer people, queer theory, queer studies, screens, and media. And I have some questions that are going to guide us through the second half of the talk, OK? So here's question number one. And this is where we're going to get into some of the turbo, going turbo. How much free space is there in a game to change the game? I think you can hear that that's really not a question about the game. It's also a question about ideology, right? How much free space is there in any set of scripted relations to change those relations? Um, I, again, that's a very hard question to answer in talking to bodies, but maybe it would be easier to answer in relationship to a game space. And in a related question, is there space within the game to go wild? So people who really do play games, that would be a good thing for you to be thinking about. Uh, and I know that there are games that are set up that that you're supposed to fail at, you're supposed to lose the game, uh, and there are also games that you really can undermine by playing them against the grain, uh, and playing them for different reasons, playing for a different trajectory and a different outcome. Uh, and maybe some people have some of those uh, narratives that they can tell us. Okay, question number two. Under what conditions in a game can so-called new life be imagined, inhabited, and enacted? Okay, again, if we're not simply interested in adding queer people to the character list, then are we actually trying to recreate what we understand as life uh, altogether? Uh, is it possible within the space of a game to reimagine what a city would look like? Uh, to reimagine how people are meeting, talking, um, uh, having sex? I don't know, let's not get into that. But you know what I'm saying? Uh, can we change social interactions by reimagining the space? Uh, does the space change the way that people interact? We know that it dub does. So under what conditions can new life be imagined, inhabited, and enacted? Where then, let's say you do create a virtual space, and I, I was talking to somebody today about, um, to Jennifer, about uh, Second Lives. Did anyone ever play Second Lives? I had so much hope for Second Lives, and I was so disappointed by it. You know, it seemed like uh, a virtual world where nothing much was happening that was any different from what you just did in the pub, okay? So there was nothing different about it. How would you know, though, when you had created a world that had newness factored into it, coded uh, into it? Where would the change have occurred? How, how do we pinpoint? the place where change emerged? Is it at the level of code, environment, action, 
actor, imagination, relation, interaction, all of the above. Um, how and when, this is the queer question if you like, how and when does heteronormativity function with any, in, within any given game? As I said with SimCity, I think that there was a sort of normativity already functioning in the game prior to the introduction of people, right? But how would we pinpoint what was normative about SimCity? How, where, and when does heteronormativity function within any game? When we talk about norms, are we talking about normative play, normative conceptions, or normative outcomes, okay? And then finally, last question, what are the possibilities for extending our understanding of queerness through games? How about the ludic, right? The ludic isn't just playing a game, it's like really getting a little bit crazy. Can you get crazy in the game? Um, can it offer us possibilities for thinking change that are not available in serious environments? That's the fun piece. When we're serious, there are certain kinds of knowledge available. When we start spinning in a kind of ludic way, there are other uh, things that we're going to think about, uh, imagine, uh, and enact. Okay? So what are the relationships between the queer, the wild, and the ludic? Now, if you think I'm going to answer any of those questions, you're sorely mistaken, because this is the sort of you know, beginning the participatory part of the evening, you'll be answering these questions. There will be a pop quiz, so um, <laughs> you might want to write something down. Okay. Okay, so I wanted, why did I, you know, what's this connection then between animation, the coding of animation through new kinds of algorithms and the coding of games through new kinds of algorithms such that we could potentially imagine something that we're tentatively calling uh, new life. Let me give you an example um, of a place where I found at least a meditation on these questions. And maybe it's a surprising place to you, but given my history of talking and writing about animation, it shouldn't be too surprising. Wreck-It Ralph. Has anyone here watched Wreck-It Ralph except for me? Thank God, five of us. All right. <laughs> for the rest, don't worry, there will be elaborate plot summary. Okay. But anyway, it's a really cute film, Josh. Your kids might uh, like it. Um, it it's, it's a cute film partly because, of course, kids are as into destroying things as they are into building. We give them building blocks, and we think that they're you know, busy building. Usually they're busy building in order to destroy. And destruction and building are absolutely on a dialectic for the child. The video game knows that, and so Wreck-It Ralph is a video game in an arcade that pits the character that wrecks things against the character who fixes things, fix it, Felix. Um, and it's a delightful um, uh, little story, and I'll try to give you uh, the basics of it, okay? So the basic conceit of the Wreck-It Ralph game evolves out of a gaming logic. Ralph is a character in a game situated in an arcade among other games, and his function in the game is to destroy buildings while the human player works as quickly as possible through an avatar named Fix-It Felix. I bet, do, do I have a, um, oh no, not yet. Um, to build up what Ralph has decimated. And Fix-It Felix is a super annoying little good guy uh, who everyone loves, and he gets all the cakes and all the rewards, and he sleeps in a warm house at night, and poor old Wreck-It Ralph is left in the town dump. And what does Fix-It Felix fix things with? He has a little annoying golden hammer that his daddy gave him, okay? So he has this little hammer, uh, and whatever uh, um, Ralph does, he fixes, um, and therefore becomes the hero of uh, every single scene. Within the game and among the game's characters, Felix predict predictably wins acclaim and love for his role as fixer, and Ralph equally predictably is the game's bad guy. He's hated, why? Because he destroys for the sake of it, and therefore has to live with his definitional negativity. Never mind that the game requires him, right? This is a Foucauldian kind of structure. The game won't work unless he destroys the building but he's still the bad guy, right? So this is a very Foucauldian production of criminality, a criminality that the system absolutely requires only so that you can now banish the criminal to the edge of town. All right, I'm gonna show you a cute little scene that for anyone who hasn't seen the film uh, will make you wanna run out and see it. Ralph is uh, protesting against this position that has been assigned to him of the bad guy and he's asking the age old question of whether he was born this way. Is he made bad or was he born bad? Okay, so he goes to a bad guy's anonymous. I don't want to be the bad guy anymore. 
You can't mess with the program, Ralph. You're not going turbo, are you? Turbo? No, I'm not going turbo. Come on, guys. Is it turbo to want a friend? Or a medal? Or a piece of pie every once in a while? Is it turbo to want more out of life? Yes. Ralph, Ralph, we get it. But we can't change who we are. And the sooner you accept that, the better off your game and your life will be. Hey, just one game at a time, Ralph. Now let's close out with the bad guy affirmation. Okay. <clears throat> I'm bad. And that's, that's good. good. I will I'll never be good. good. And that's, that's not, not bad. bad. There's no one I'd rather be than me. So cute, right? Okay, this is really like hearkening back to Toy Story because the mise-en-scene has nothing to do with the humans. It's what I was saying earlier about the relationships really being between the toys and in this case being between the characters in the game. Nobody wants Ralph to be too dissatisfied because they don't want him to go turbo. Going turbo is what I described earlier and asked questions about. It's when you leave the game, you leave the logic of the game, uh, and therefore the game is no longer playable. Uh, and the arcade only runs if everyone conforms to the logic of the game. So no one must go turbo. And that's kind of a, an interesting kind of queerness, a queer function uh, of leaving the game, refusing the game, refusing the system as it has been set up uh, in advance of you joining it, right? The system is set up for Ralph to fail over and over and over again, so his choice is either to play the role that's been assigned to him or to go turbo and leave the game. So that begins to answer that question of how you can change uh, the game. And of course, uh, Ralph is not uh, happy with his lot in life, and he does in fact seek to leave the game, uh, and I'll tell you uh, later uh, what happens uh, then. Um, but I also want to say that the film isn't just subversive, and many times when I'm reading these animated films, I'm not only looking for subversive stories, I'm noticing the way in which these um, kinds of animations are both conventional and subversive at the same time. This is a deeply conventional story uh, in that it has a sort of assimilationist narrative where Ralph can be brought into the community as long as he's just like us. So he has to not be other in order to be uh, assimilated. It's also conventional because it sets up a good and evil uh, binary. Uh, even though they may be dependent upon each other, they're also exclusive uh, of each other. And then it's also conventional in that it's a quest for redemption. Ralph wants redemption. He doesn't want to change the world. He wants to be accepted. Uh, so we might wish for an algorithm that is not about just you know, being accepted into the world as is, but is the algorithm for absolute transformation uh, of the game altogether. Okay. Uh, it's also the, the, the final piece that makes it a kind of conventional uh, game is because there are a lot of obviously queer characters in Wreck-It Ralph, and it tries to pair them all up romantically uh, at the end, including Jane. Do you guys know who Jane Lynch is? She plays a very butch soldier who we're supposed to believe is romantically involved at the end with Fix-It Felix, whose voice actor is the gay guy from 30 Rock. Do you know who I mean, the blonde guy? So you've got the blonde gay guy from 30 Rock, playing Felix, and you've got the blonde butch female character from Glee, and they're supposed to be a romantic couple. Do you see? So, so it's not in, you know, even when you have gay characters, they're still being forced into a sort of heteronormative uh, narrative. But here's the point. Um, uh, so I'm not only claiming that this is a kind of subversive uh, film, the film does transcend expectations in a way that might be significant uh, to us here at this conference as we struggle to move our notions of change, queerness, and transformation beyond a quest for recognizable gay, lesbian characters on the other, on one hand, and humanitarian and non-violent scripts uh, on the other. It does so mostly by scrambling, in fact, the relationships between good and evil, managing to animate a class critique of the distribution of good and evil across the characters, and here's a great um, image of, w you know, the function of Ralph is a constitutive exclusion. His exclusion allows for the realm of Fix-It Felix to seem viable, uh, right, um, good, magic, uh, and so on. Um, 
and re by also um, r recognizing the glitch in the matrix that far from representing the evil of disorder in the site of failure actually presents opportunities for unpredictable and improvised modes of transformation. Now, what is the glitch then in Wreck-It Ralph? And then I'll, I'll move on to my last section uh, before concluding. The glitch is uh, a little character in another game that these characters go off to the sh called Sugar Rush. And there's a little female character in that game who has become detached from the system and functions only as a glitch. And it is her solidarity with Wreck-It Ralph that creates the transformative possibility in the game. Do you see? So the person who represents the constitutive exclusion joins forces with those two queer characters who are being forced into a romance and the glitch in the machine, and their solidarity brings about transformation because they are, all of them, violations of the code of the game. All right. There you have it. Okay. <laughs> See what I mean about Fix-It Felix? Super irritating. <laughs> the little hammer and all that from Daddy. Okay. All right. We, we're, um, and we did that. There's, that's the romanticized couple. And here's the glitch. So that's what, what I wanted to begin with. Whenever the little uh, character who has been dislodged from the game and now only appears as a glitch, because uh, we see this kind of glitching uh, in the animated film itself. And again, rather than look away or be annoyed that there's this interruption to the game as it should be played, I'm suggesting that there's an interesting aesthetic that is embedded in glitch visualizations um, themselves. All right, so queer coding, moving right along. And I'm going to conclude by just saying a little bit about the way in which some queer theorists are talking about tech. Um, and, uh, and then I have one, one last piece before, um, before ending. So there are a couple of people who are working on queer tech and focusing on the hardware rather than the software. First, let me talk about the hardware, then I'll tell you about a few queer games uh, by way of conclusion. Uh, so Zach Blass is a, both a somebody who makes art um, out of techno hardware um, and also uh, somebody who writes about uh, queer tech. Um, and he creates these things he calls gay bombs, which are concepts that he wants to drop into the discourse uh, to create uh, explosive uh, reactions. Um, and he has these images of the bombs themselves, that, and they've been a bit controversial because people are like, oh, you want to pose as a terrorist? That seems really problematic. Do you want to make this connection between queerness and terroristic violence? And his point is that, well, people like Osama bin Laden were already representationally uh, being cast as effeminate, homoerotic, as queer in some way, and therefore his queer bombs were taking back this representational coding uh, of, um, uh, of uh, the other, if you like. Misha Cardenas creates wearable technologies that allow queer people in a room to signal to each other that they're all in the same space. And so you'd wear these devices. It's a little bit like Grindr or something, I think. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but they're a little more cumbersome than just looking on your phone. You're supposed to be sending out little messages. Uh, and it, it wouldn't just be for gay people. I mean, the heterosexual people who found each other attractive, too, could send little messages um, to each other. So this idea of wearable technologies that would enhance the coding back and forth between people and maybe even formalize it in some way becomes part of what she understands as um, queer uh, hardware. Zach Blass um, uh, notes, citing uh, Galloway and Thacker, uh, that, that coding, uh, queerness means writing qu code. And so queer theory is queer code. It breaks codes, recodes, hacks codes, and drags code. In other words, it's almost impossible to think about theory separate from what we're calling coding. So queer theory and queer gaming um, are easily connected. All right, the way I'm going to wind down then is by uh, telling you, uh, oh, first I'll talk about this, uh, the, the role of failure and then a few gay games to just sort of wrap up, okay? Um, so in my book, in The Queer Art of Failure, I actually advocate for failure. I, I, it's not that I'm describing the way in which failure is always being assigned to queer people. I advocate for failure 
saying that in a world that's only interested in profits and normativity, one should learn to be a loser, right? If capitalism only cares about making money, then it would be anti-capitalist to refuse to make money, to, to, to lose, right? To fail to profit. Um, in a world that only cares about families, it would be worthwhile to learn how to fail in order to create the possibility of other forms of uh, intimacy. So this was, a, this was the argument. Well, right when my book came out, Jesper Jewell put out a book about the pain of playing video games called The Art of Failure, okay? And he makes a very similar argument but leaves the queer stuff out. And the argument in Jesper Jewell is that when we play video games, you have to remember that you rarely are playing simply to win. Because if you played a video game and the first time you played it, you won it, you wouldn't play it again. And the developers of the game need you to play it again. So they need you to fail. The game requires you to fail in order for it to be a worthwhile game. And you may play it 25 times before you actually win it. The minute you win it, it's over in many ways, okay? So winning is actually often not the point. And he's interested in the pain that we feel when we play video games and the repetition that we engage, the fact that we go back to that pain over and over and over again. And he even wants to argue that potentially we play video games because we long for the pain of failure. A pain of, the pain of failure that is you know, something that we want to avoid in our everyday lives is actually almost pleasurable when we encounter it in the realm of a game. Okay? Now, it's similar to, I know it sounds kooky, but it's similar to an argument that was made quite a long time ago by Carol Clover about horror films in a great book called Men, Women, and Chainsaws. Does anyone know that book except for me? Okay. So in Men, Women, and Chainsaws, Carol Clover said, you know why I think young boys, let's young boys, teenage boys go to see horror films? Not because they identify with the killer, because they get to masochistically identify with the victim. And in a world where boys are being trained to only be engaged with mastery, success, coherence, wholeness, right? It's a relief to be the chased rather than the chaser. It's a relief to be the victim rather than uh, the predator. And she made a whole argument about the masochism of the boy who wants to leave behind this emphasis upon mastery and, and completely you know, be in this realm where he doesn't have to uh, be in control. That's a s a similar, I think. And for this reason, in horror films, the girl who survives is often very androgynous. Have you noticed that, right? It's, she's called the final girl. And as soon as you see an androgynous girl in a horror film, she'll survive. So Clover says the girl has to be androgynous because both boys and girls identify with her. Now, I think it's quite similar to this argument about the pain of playing video games. We presume that we play to win. It is true when we play other kinds of games and sports, we play to win. But is it possible, as Jasper Jewell says, that we don't play video games to win, we play to fail? And the pain of failure is actually what we should be investigating rather than the triumph of succeeding. Think Wreck-It Ralph. He represents the pain of failure. He is the failed element in the game that makes the game worthwhile in the first place, okay? So I want to offer that up by way of then introducing a few games that I think have a very, very queer element to them. Um, and they're not necessarily set up to be queer games. Does anyone know this one, Analog, A Hate Story? Because, yeah, it's made by a Canadian, Christine Love. Um, it's a narrative game that you enter into, um, and you come, a, as a player in the game, you enter into this role-playing world where you find a spaceship, uh, and I think it's in like 2052, and the spaceship has been circulating through space since the John Dynasty, it's a Korean spaceship, which is a medieval Korean dynasty, and everyone on the spaceship is dead, okay? And what you have to do is figure out what happened here, okay? What happened here? Uh, why, uh, when this, this spaceship had uh, um, um, survived for many years, why eventually did the people on the spaceship die out? Now, the answer to the game is that the, the spaceship became embroiled in a patriarchal crisis, 
And the only way that you can resolve the problem of the game is to think like a feminist um, and come up with solutions around this patriarchal order that was self-destructive, okay? What it means to think like a feminist isn't clear because you have two AIs in the game who are advising you and both of them are unreliable. Um, but it's, an, it's a feminist game that is coding, is coding a solution to the problem of social failure through the aegis of feminism. Do you see what I mean? So just think of Grand Theft Auto, a, a silly game like that. What if that game had a feminist solution? You know, you've got to find some bad guys and these women have to like track them down. Or, or somebody's behaving sexistly and in a sexist way and people have to stop that person from behaving that way. Uh, that's sort of, and somebody here has played it so they'll probably tell me I'm completely wrong. But Something like that is at play in Analog, um, a hate story. It's super text-based, so you're doing a lot of reading. Uh, the, the idea that you just enter seamlessly into this world is completely wrong. You do a ton of reading. Um, you're endlessly trying to resolve things, and you're often wrong. Failure is part of the game. Another one, um, this has been called a kind of riot girl game called Gone Home. Okay, again, there isn't really a successful outcome to this game, but it's similar to the other one in that you enter, you come home for the holidays. It's a college kid who's been away, comes home, everyone's gone. And you have to navigate this virtual realm and try to figure out what has happened here. It's very similar to the other one. Um, but in the process, what you find out is very affectively moving. So the point of the game is not simply to find, you read the clues, move through the, the environment, and arrive at a solution. The point is actually to be changed by your contact with the narratives that you uncover. And people get very emotionally caught up in this game, and that's what has made it register as a feminist game. Not just that there's a feminist politics you, you know, being played out, but that the game is something about affect and about provoking an affective reaction that changes you, literally changes you by playing the game. So that goes back to one of those questions that I had, what would constitute change and where exactly uh, would it happen? Uh, it's been called a, a riot girl game, um, partly because in the process of scripting this, this virtual journey, it changes what we understand gaming to actually be. Okay, and there are a couple of others that uh, other people may uh, know, um, but I'm going to move to my conclusion. Okay, so I'm just going to conclude by um, saying that going turbo, it seems to me, and remember what going turbo is. Going turbo is where you leave the game. Now, you don't leave the whole realm of gaming, but you leave the logic of the game that produced you. Okay, so if you were in Wreck-It Ralph and your role was to tear everything down, uh, you enter another game, and you serve another role, and you interact with other players in different ways. It's an anti-identity politics, right? That you l you're not born that way, you don't only play the role that was assigned to you, but you figure out how to enter into other games, that's the point of Wreck-It Ralph, and become a different kind of player because you're in a game where your role isn't scripted uh, in the same way. The other thing is that when you bring all these different players together, you get surprising solidarities that change the meaning of relation. So if Felix and Wreck-It Ralph are, are just completely stuck in a dialectic of good and evil, what happens when Wreck-It Ralph hooks up with the little girl who's the glitchy girl, right? They don't get involved in a romance, but her being a glitch and him being a bad guy, they actually reinforce each other rather than dialectically oppose each other. And in that function, they are able to release each other from the logic of their games. Do you see what I mean? So going turbo, it turns out, um, is part of what we mean by uh, going wild and changing the game altogether. All right, so I'm gonna conclude then, and I just have a little, um, a little paragraph that I want to read by way of conclusion. And it gives you the, the outcome to Wreck-It Ralph, which will ruin it for you. Sorry about that. <laughs> so in Sugar Rush, which is the game that Ralph goes turbo and goes to instead. He meets Vanellope, that's a little girl. Vanellope was once a great driver, Sugar Rush is a driving game, but the evil king of Sugar Rush has unplugged her from the game central brain so that she appears as a glitch. 
As a glitch, she can't race. She becomes an outcast against whom the other game characters come to define themselves as fast, good, true, and sweet. It's Sugar Rush. Sweetness is a currency in the realm of Sugar Rush. To cut a long, sh long story short, Ralph's journey, however, introduces a virus uh, into Sugar Rush, and the game, like Ralph's game, gets shut down and is under threat of being totally destroyed. Ralph, Felix, the female soldier, and Vanellope join forces against the evil king, the sort of the sovereign ruler, defeat the virus and bring Sugar Rush back to life. And I love this idea of sugar as a kind of currency, like that the point is not to win money, the point is just to create more sweetness. I mean, it's almost like Matthew Arnold or something, you know, we're, we're trying to create sweetness and light in the world. The collaborative effort to save these game worlds allows Ralph to see the good in Felix who can fix what he can break. Vanellope recognizes that she was made a glitch, not born one, and she argues for a different form of community and even for the power of the glitch. And the evil king, who'd gone turbo and tried to change the game to his advantage by fixing it so that only he would win, has been vanquished and destroyed. By the end of the game, everyone's back in their places, but everything has changed. That's the beauty of everyone playing each other's games and then coming back to the beginning. Even as Wreck-It Ralph seems critical of the good-bad log logic of destructive Ralph versus creative Felix, it also recognizes that we cannot live without these binary dialectics. And so, while we can't make binary oppositions disappear, we can make community dependent upon the recognition of all the different parts of the matrix rather than the valorization of some parts over others. We can also embrace the glitch, tear down as much as we build up, and every once in a while, Go well and truly turbo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, if you have a question, there's a mic in the, uh, in the aisle. Uh, please come to reveal yourself and your question. Uh, please use the mic because it's uh, connected to the soundboard and that will allow us to record the entire discussion. Okay. It will live on in the archive. <laughs> no pressure, though. No. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful speech. We read Career Out of Failure and Professor... Can you hear me through yeah. this? Okay. Uh, we read Career Art of Failure in Professor Brady's class. Uh, we actually just discussed it yesterday. Truly wonderful. Um, and I was really struck... Uh, in particular, in the introduction, in sort of speaking to failure within uh, academia and academic contexts, yep. you speak about uh, the documentary The Class and the professor in France who had uh, a severe amount of disconnect with his students and asked them at the end of the class if they had learned anything. And right. the girl comes up and says, I, I truly learned nothing. It's right. like not a, a dig, but a true, like an, an actual sort of like confession. Um, and, uh, and I think the phrase that you said was, how do you, how do you, how do you be taught to lead, not, or, or how do you lead to be, how do you lead to learn, not teach to follow? Yeah. Um, so I think I, I come from a background in the arts, and in the arts, failure is is a part of the creative process. It's actually the idea that you could succeed is is the foreign idea. Yeah. The idea of failing, of trying, and and knowing that that idea might not lead anywhere is 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 essential to creating, and especially collaborative creation. But I'm curious, now being in an academic context, and you do speak to this a bit in the book, but if you could speak here about, do you see a sort of a pedagogy of failure? Like, how do we actually bring the idea of failure? Can it be taught? Can it be brought into the classroom? Mm -hmm. um, it, even mm -hmm. on a graduate level, like, can you bring people into their master's program and go, now we're gonna talk about how you're not gonna succeed. Right. Um, can failure be a pedagogy? Right, it's very, grad students are really not the people to talk to failure about. They. <laughs> They feel that very keenly. But, you know, the point is not, I actually used to, when the book first came out, I went around with the book and, and I called my, my little presentation How to Fail, like a self-help guide, you know, um, which of course is ridiculous because we all know very well how to fail. So the point is, is not simply to teach people how to fail. The point is for us to recognize the logic of success and failure and how it's weighted always 
towards the success of some pe people um, based upon the fixed failure of the many. You know, I, I mean, the 1% the, the and the 99% was one formulation of this. That, um, and and the, the best articulation of it is to think about capitalism really not as a system, a system that distributes wealth, but more like a gaming uh, table where as long as many people are willing to bet, a few people can win. And we're very, it's very clear that capitalism is now a game. And it's a game akin to, to gambling, not a game akin to some of these sort of complex games that um, you might play in your spare time. Not an environment where all kinds of different outcomes are possible, but in fact, um, capitalism is a game like Vegas that is set up to make sure that a very, very few people walk away with huge amounts of money on the basis of many, many people being seduced into betting. So failure, under those circumstances, we have to see failure as the norm, you know? And once you start thinking about failure as, in fact, statistically the average, then you do things differently. So if we all understood that not being wealthy was statistically the, the average, then we would be less inclined to support a system that rewards the rich, you know? If we recognize, to give a different uh, environment for thinking about this, that it is, n it is in fact statistically average for marriages to end rather than to, ha to last the whole lifetime of the participants, then we might think differently about marriage. Do you see? So if instead of saying to a 15-year-old, oh, you'll find, you'll find your person and you'll settle down with your one person. You will. It's going to be great and your prince will come. Your princess will arrive. Um, okay. Or you could say, over the course of your lifetime, you will have uh, lots of wonderful relationships. Get on with it. You know, you're 15. You should get going because there's lots of people out there. Um, what are you waiting for? Uh, don't worry about marriage and what the outcome is going to be. Uh, you know, romance is also a game. Let's use this notion of game. It's a game. Don't play it as like, you know, this has to, be, you know, immediately uh, be set in stone and last forever. That will kill it right there. So a lot of the things that we do socially are set up like games. If we understood failure to be part and parcel of what we were playing in that sort of the pain of failure way, we would play the game differently. And I think that's where I'm trying to go with this metaphor of the game. If you're not focused on success, you play differently. Everyone does. Once they stop worrying about succeeding, they play the game differently. And I'm pushing for that through the failure stuff and definitely with the gaming stuff. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Yeah. Um, I love that you brought up Zach Braff and the queer technologies. Yeah. Like, I love this idea of um, you know, looking at hardware and how it could be male and female and how yeah. even um, there's the example of like, you know, let's transform what power gets um, through to the CEO. Like, we can do that through hardware. We can make sure that the right. CEO actually gets, a, you know, less power right. to their computer. And, right. you know, what, what kind of, <laughs> how can we play with power in terms of, like, looking at this theoretical level and making that work in terms of hardware? But um, I loved your talk, and I loved um, that you focused on, on a lot of symbolic level of, of this issue, and I'm really interested in the materiality of it as well. Right. And so when we talk about code, I'm really curious about um, the ways in which this plays out on a material level, how we can look at code. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's social media software in particular, but how code could be seen as this material structural level of society that we also need to disrupt. Okay. So um, how, I don't know. So give us an example. Okay, um, well, Facebook. Yeah. Uh, very obvious right now. The last two weeks, you know, there's been major changes happening to the profile. You okay. know, there's uh, 58 new options for gender. Right. 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 But, um, well, through my experiments, I can f discover that at the level of the database, there's nothing, nothing has changed. Yeah. You're still actually, each user yeah. is transformed back into the binary at the level of the database. Okay. But, right. but that's a perfect illustration of what I'm saying, that we're, 
we are endlessly being fooled in some ways, and I don't want to just make a false consciousness argument, but software is complicated enough that we often think that change has occurred because we can see that now we have more options, but just as in capitalism, you feel that you have many options and then you find out they're all owned by the same company, you know? Um, second Cup and Tim Hortons, oh, great, I have many choices. They're owned by the same company. I don't know if they are, they probably are. But, um, <laughs> but and plus they serve the same bad coffee, so who cares, right? But that's right, at the deep level of the change in Facebook, there is no change, right? So we want to both be interested in surface and depth here, but also recognize that surface and depth doesn't, doesn't actually do justice to the particular topography of a social media. Yeah so, yeah, so I guess my question would be then, how can we s conceive of software as a structural material reality that um, embeds ideas about gender, ideas about all kinds of things, uh, all kinds of social con constructs, and how can we then um, try to trouble software at the level of materiality of the code? Yeah. No, it's a, the, it's a great question, but uh, um, I think that's why I keep focusing on the algorithm, and it may be that, you know, I may be even misusing the, the term algorithm, but algorithm is like a formulation that make, re makes it possible to render something that was previously not possible in the world of animation. You know, so as I say, you, you couldn't realistically make fur um, in, in animation, which is why when you see Tom and Jerry, they don't have fur, right? Tom and Jerry don't have fur, they just have like, they're just a color, right? But Monsters, Inc., they have fur. Now, you think, well, who cares? But think of something like Fantastic Mr. Fox. The rustling of the fur in Fantastic Mr. Fox is a huge part of why that, that stop motion animation actually works. And it's being rendered differently there because it's stop motion. But still, something the, the nature of the real shifts and changes in relationship to some of the algorithms that we are able to produce to represent it, right? Um, so I think there's, there's, there's that point. Um, but I also think that we are limited by what we, uh, can, what we have produced uh, outside of the realm of social technology. We are limited then when we go into the realm of social technology by these presumptions that we bring with us. And I think what's sort of exciting about gaming is that people are actually coming up with different ways of thinking about not simply who you are when you're in the social media space, but, for example, you might change things by changing the environment, right? So you, you, you might change everything by changing the landscape within which people interact rather than just sh thinking about, is this character going to be recognizably uh, gay or lesbian? So I think that I'm saying that you can't change things sort of in there until things are also reimaginable out here and that there's a, a lively and dynamic interaction between those kinds of spaces. And they're not even two spaces, they're thousands of spaces. Yeah. Again, thank you for coming and I uh, really appreciated your talk. Um, I kind of feel like uh, a little bit on Charles. My name's Kyle and I'm a gamer. Uh-oh. <laughs> Okay, so, um, hit me. I, I, yeah, I want to kind of take yeah. a, a stab at answering one of the questions that you raised in your talk. Okay. Um, uh, one specifically about uh, where we can go with, with queer gaming and how we could possibly break into the industry that way. Um, I know mainstream games, the one that I was thinking about your whole talk was uh, the Mass Effect series. Yeah. For, for those who have played it, there it's a, um, a dialogue-driven game. There's action involved, but the main the story is driven through dialogue and characters' choices. And there are... Um, a romance options within the game that caused quite a stir uh, back in the day, where you could um, not in the original game, but in the sequels, you could either, you could um, do male on male, or female on female, or even male and alien, female and alien, which gave a bunch of different uh, options, and people became uncomfortable with. Wow. Yeah. But at the same time, though, it's also the uh, the quintessential pop culture versions of those relationships. There right. was there was nothing that was really um, uh, different or unique about these kinds of situations. It was just there, and it was just an option for the player to choose. Um, where I think the groundbreaking um, changes can happen are in games like Home Alone yeah. that you mentioned earlier. So it would be the indie scene where that is. 
um, going to happen because I think big companies like BioWare, who created Mass Effect, um, are more constrained within uh, the corporate culture and within uh, more traditional norms simply because A, they're massive, and B, they're expected to follow a, s a set of, uh, I guess, gendered norms. Yeah. yeah. Whereas uh, indie games, um, and especially it's more relevant now simply because of uh, things like Steam Workshop and Steam Greenlight prog programs for computer games where uh, indie games are becoming much more popular and uh, they're, they're getting out there a lot more. And uh, I'll use Home Alone as an example because I played the game and I absolutely loved the game. Um, it allows for a different type of, type of storytelling and a different sort of yep. way that it can happen. So. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I think, I mean, that sort of captures, y y you know, what the limits are of um, our desire for the games to give us a portal, if you like, which is the name of one of these games. You know, there is that portal game where you literally have to figure out how to make new portals. It's very, it's very queer, actually, because it's, 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 it's like making holes where there are not holes and trying to figure out <laughs> how to access, uh, uh, put things in them. And <laughs> but it's, the portal game is really quite interesting because of it's asking you to make your way through space separate from the pathways that have been given to you. And I keep coming back to that, um, which may, may suggest that, you know, subversion has simply been very, very formally scripted for us and there's nowhere to go because even the ways in which we uh, can rebel are already scripted into the game. That's the, the kind of, um, that's the ideological read that um, I would say an old-fashioned Marxist might give, a sort of Zizakian uh, Marxist, if you like, is gonna give that kind of uh, read. But I think that for people who are really engaged with games, as you say, there are indie games, um, there's a lot of thought that goes into trying to figure out, on the one hand, how to create in the gamer himself or herself a meditation on possibility, probability, potentiality, um, and then also how to offer up spaces uh, that are somewhat satisfying in relationship to difference, change, and transformation. It's very hard for us to be satisfied with, with outcomes, as it turns out. Um, and I think that um, y you know, the more you can customize a game, the more likely it is that you're gonna be able to, uh, you feel that something has succeeded in your relation to the game, uh, other than just you know, having an outcome, completing the game. Completing the game is never the point, it seems to me. The other piece of this, of course, uh, is, it, is Mass Effect a dialogue game that you dialogue with another player? Right. 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 So these interactions also produce all kinds of unpredictable outcomes. It seems, um, and unpredictability is a huge part of this. So, thank you for, you. yeah. Hi, this is Jenny. These microphones are always like taller than me. It's yeah. very frustrating. Um, I loved your talk, and uh, I, I did pick up on a, an interesting tension. Yeah. And that is between the, um, the, the argument that uh, technological change or messing around with the technology creates the possibilities for newness. But then there's also this really interesting strain of nostalgia yeah. that runs through the talk as well. I mean, Wreck-It Ralph is great because it's Donkey Kong, basically, right? And you've got the Mortal Kombat dude, and you've got Blinky and Pinky and whatever else from Pac-Man. Yeah. So I wanted to maybe hear you talk a little bit about the role of the past, of pastness, in the creation of futurity. So maybe speaking a little bit more to your work on temporality and, and really thinking about the fact that you know, gaming and gaming culture requires building on what's already there and that that is at the level of code, but it's also on the level of the symbolic. Mm. And so what role does the past, does nostalgia, that which already has been, play in our effort to make something new? As a historian, I figured I had to throw something about time and and before you leave, what, what uh, let me ask you what I, I mean, what do you what do you think? I, I mean, it, I, I absolutely am not trying to make an argument about a newness that is comes from nowhere and is just you know is literally a glitch. Something glitchy happens and there's a new. Uh, opportunity and I do that's a really great point about Wreck-It Ralph that it's a, a conglomeration 
of the bad guys from all the other games. It's not just, um, you, you know, random bad guys, right? Some of these bad guys, we recognize the bad guys. So it's a solidarity of all the different bad guys from all the different games. Uh, but there's a queer, it seems to me that there's a queer history there itself that, or if you think about all of the rejects of history, all of the uh, different kinds of identity positions uh, that have represented constitutive exclusions, exclusions that, that allow the system to operate uh, as good and true, right? Um, then that solidarity, it seems to me, is sort of uh, an interesting way of thinking about queer history. Do you know what I mean? By putting, putting those figures into connection uh, rather than reading them as uh, completely separate entities particular to their, only to their historical moment. I mean, what's kind of great is that the Pac-Man, the little Pac-Man figure um, is given new meaning by its relationship to Wreck-It Ralph, right? It doesn't any longer just seem like the, it's the one that eats the, the, the Pac people, pa Miss Pac-Man as well, I guess, Pac people, right? It's not just that it, it, it's that it now becomes part of a system that is, we can see precisely because we line the games up and we see all of the different bad guys in relation. Um, is it nostalgic though? I'm not sure if it's nostalgic so much as maybe it reminds us that what we often are seduced into thinking of as very new when a new game comes out often takes the very same form as the games that have come before it, which I think was what the other guy was also saying, the packaging, right? The packaging may be new, but we may in fact just be playing Super Mario over and over again, or we may just be playing Dungeons and Dragons over and over again. So I don't know if it's nostalgic so much as repetitive, which of course are different things. As a historian, do you accept any of that? But I, I do, I do. I just thought it was really interesting that you, you know, your two examples yeah. of these, these really wonderful examples of doing it differently, of breaking the mold. Yeah. Are yeah. the ones that are, are harder to identify sort of the historicity of game culture. Yeah. Right? Whereas something like Wreck-It Ralph, which is wonderful for this argument, yeah. really does make a point of, of drawing on this, this lineage yeah. in order to sort of make these, these arguments uh -huh. I think you're making. And so I, yeah. I just found that very interesting. I was trying to process it yeah. um, at the very end. Well, I also want to be careful about, um, you know, I, I've noticed recently, like a lot of people, th there's a certain consistency to, to what I claim in different work. You know, in the, in the Queer Art of Failure, I, I'm saying, okay, you want to know how to upset the logic of success and failure? Learn how to fail. You know, and in Gaga Feminism, I'm, I'm saying, okay, things have become very, very chaotic in relationship to gender and sex. Let's not, let's not restore order. Let's make it even more chaotic, you know. So there's a, I have a kind of, I obviously go for this homeopathic method where, where there's crisis, more crisis. Where there's um, success, failure, more failure, you know. But I'm, I've been accused recently of that th this sneaks liberalism back in, in the form of a sort of individual quest. And I can see that a little bit in this argument, that it seems to be arguing for figuring out the game or the logic or the algorithm that's really going to transform things that then gets embodied in a couple of little characters so that we might be back in the realm of a sort of heroic individualism uh, within which someone figures out how to break the code. And I really don't mean, even though I think that, that we're all overwhelmed by that logic, however much we try to dispute it, that's part of how liberalism works, um, I don't I mean, I'm really not talking about individuals anyway. I'm talking about characters that have nothing to do with a subjectivity. Um, but I do keep wanting to uh, suggest that where these moments of change occur, it's part of a system or it's part of a solidarity or it's part of a structure, not simply an individual quest. But we'll talk more, Jennifer. Thank you. Yes. I hang out on social media a lot, and I've noticed that something like what you were talking about sometimes happens on Twitter, and okay. probably on Facebook too, and it actually it speaks to that larger, more collective participation in a game and in a glitch, and the one that came to mind, where, where a game breaks out, and it, it can be like a global game where people yeah. are exploring the medium in a new way, and the one I was thinking of was, there was a woman about three months ago who, she sent a, she was a, she's a PR executive, and she wrote this really offensive, hostile tweet that was racist and offensive to Africans, and she was on her way to Africa, 
Mm. And um, but she had to turn off her phone, right? She, so she sent out this tweet, and then she had to turn off her phone for like nine hours or 14 hours while she was in transit. And in the meantime, her uh, her tweet got retweeted, her right. offensive racist tweet. And this hashtag got set up, and I, I can't remember what her name was, but it's something like Chelsea. So it was, has Chelsea landed yet? And over the 14 hours in which she was in the air, this hashtag was used about 60 million times around the world as wow. all these people were waiting to see what would happen when Chelsea <laughs> landed in the country that she had been Being offensive, offensive about, towards. right. Yeah. I mean, there was a little bit of a nastiness and a mm -hmm. schadenfreude quality to it, but there was, there was also this quality of like, what can we do with this medium? And, and there was a kind of almost like weird moment of global solidarity and mm -hmm. solidarity in which so many people thought what this woman did was was absolutely offensive and mm -hmm. inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And I was, I've never seen like that happen on a global right, scale right. before. Right. I felt like it was the it was the platform of the social media being explored in terms of like what can we do here that's, that's different. Well, it's also um, the you know this is the structure of the the, the viral that we're 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 happy to bandy this word around, but actually the structure of the viral is very complicated. So I'll just I'll, I'll just give you an example when. When Gaga Feminism was coming out, I published it with a trade press, and I was very earnest and naive, and I thought, okay, it's not an academic book. I know how to market this to a popular audience. I really had a fantasy it would be a popular book, which, of course, it wasn't. Um, partly, not because it's written in a complicated way, but because it's not really saying things that people you know, popularly believe or even want to hear, for that matter. But I went to the press, and I said, What's the marketing strategy? Because I do a bit of traveling, and I'd be happy to do some little book talks. And they were like, mm, yeah, we don't really do those anymore, book talks. Like, you mean the author, like, showing up and trying to sell? Oh, no. That's just so cumbersome. Who would do that? And I was like, yeah, OK, I kind of get that. What's the plan? Oh, we're just going to, we're just going to, like, put a bunch of stuff out on the internet and hope it goes viral. I was like, wow, really? Does that, that's the plan? You know? And that's actually the plan for a lot of what we call publicity. Uh, and and we, were, you know, we were talking about PR, you know. A lot of the plan for publicity is about going viral. And it turns out that going viral, there's nothing random about it. What you think are random things that have gone, oh, look, Ellen's tweet of her with Brad Pitt and, you know, all the stars at the Oscars. Wow, that went viral. I mean, that's not exactly surprising, right? But it turns out there are companies that what they do for you is they'll take what you need to sell and they will see if they can make it go viral. So it's actually a thing that you pay for. It's not organic. It's not at all organic. And that may have seemed organic, but even that probably there was some other logic at work there. And that's what makes it so hard in the end to actually change what we're calling here the symbolic. Because a lot of times what we're doing is tinkering in the realm of what Lacan would call the imaginary or what some of us would call the ideological, but we're not really shifting anything in the larger scheme of things uh, because we often are mistaking effects for causes and vice versa. Um, so I think that the, the structure of the viral is something that we really actually need to know a lot more about in order to understand how we are actually at the other end of marketing systems that rely upon the viral rather than being disrupted by it. And that's why my work doesn't quite go far enough because I am still, that's why I'm saying I'm doing this self-critique of being a little bit stuck in the possibility of thinking that there could be change or that we would s know change when, when, when we see it. Because I'm not sure that we would because it's so the, 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 the way in which, um, let's say, capital has, has already penetrated our social media, to get back to some of the earlier questions, is such that the things that, that appear to us in the realm of the random, the accidental, the surprising, and the ludic, actually were already marketing techniques that have understood viral pathways and have made much better use of them than any of our little um, theories or indie games could do. That's the really bleak version of this. Um, but also, I guess the other thing I want to say is that, again, we are very, one of the things that really holds us up is the way in which we do politics. And even in that, you know, the being offended by someone's speech as opposed to being offended by, say, global racism. You know, so we're all going to attach to the tweet, oh, has Chelsea, oh, that damn Chelsea, as opposed to 
you know, the entire U.S. government, right? We're, we're, we're able to now fixate on the symptom rather than the actual illness. And I, again, I think Twitter feed makes you feel as if a solution, uh, we nailed her. We really nailed her for being racist. And there's a lot of this calling out, telling people that they're, their speech is bad, they said something wrong, but not much fixing at the level of the structural inequalities that produce the racism in the first place, right? So I'm, I would say, on the one hand, let's, let's really think together about what the possibilities are for a kind of, kind of counter-capitalist occupation of the viral pathways, but on the other hand, let's not fool ourselves. So, thank you. And she's back. Is that allowed? I don't know. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Everybody okay with this? Okay. Uh. If, you know, if they start like booing or or yeah. clapping or whatever they do. Tell me if it's happening behind my back. I will. I, I will watch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think there's a whole economy going on right now to try to track how these algorithms are changing. Yeah. Because they're changing all the time, and they're you know they're opaque. We can't reach them. We can't even see them, and right. they're restricted from our access. But I'm just curious then, if we're interested in a larger project of social change, um, how do we conceive of power? How do you conceive of power? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one of those like huge questions yeah. um, that Sorry. I'm probably not gonna um, answer, um, other than to say I do, I think that is a very, very good question, but the only answer that seems appropriate here is to say, Whatever theory of power we have going, we need to keep updating it the same way you update your damn phone, you know, um, because things shift so fast in relationship to the, the nexus of systems that are representation, subjectivity, ideology, flow of capital, are changing so fast that we can't just be happy with the Foucauldian version that we got and, you know, keep rehearsing it. Uh, it seems to me that we are endlessly having to update our version of power. The version that I just gave you where we see something surprising and we say, oh my gosh, this has gone viral, that's so weird, and then we realize it was a marketing strategy all along, suggests that there's a, uh, an endless kind of catch-up game that we are doomed to play uh, that is deeply disappointing. But at the same time, some of the games that I think I was asking us to think about, games that make you feel something, as opposed to games that make you do something, suggest that we are also uh, inventive in relationship to changing the changing nature of power. Do, shall we say this is the last question, Josh? Okay, I, I've got a positive last question. Great. So I just want to say I really uh, enjoyed your talk. Thank you. And I love the idea of going crazy, going wild, going ludic. And yeah. I really see that there is a possibility in gaming and digital platforms in this notion of disembodied bodies, perhaps, and new, perform new gender performances. And I'm just wondering if you can provide some other avenues for going crazy as a subversive. Oh, you know, I see, yeah. yes. A well, actually, this tool. this mm -hmm. piece is to be in a book uh, um, on the wild. Uh, and I, I am interested in whether there is such a thing as the wild anymore. And I don't just mean wilderness, and I don't just mean animals roaming free. Um, I, I mean spaces that um, are exactly as I'm saying, spaces that are not pre-colonized um, and therefore programmed to produce surprise and curiosity and wonder. But, but spaces, whether aesthetic, political, social, or otherwise, that are capable of some kind of unpredictable, randomized um, production. Um, and I have lots of, you know, the, as with other things that I've written, the interesting part of the book is its archive, you know, the things that can go into the archive of the wild. I have a, one chapter on the relationship between animals and children as liminal creatures that, that allow us to glimpse um, changing features of what we call the human. Um, or uh, I have a chapter on um, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring as um, an event that produces startling new relationships between so-called modern and primitive um, and also provokes a kind of riot of bourgeois taste in response. Um, I, and I have, um, you know, this chapter, I have uh, ch lot different chapters that are trying to explore the possibility of a continued space of surprise. Mm -hmm. 
I imagine that this is exactly why I get called, you know, a, a, a liberal who keeps being invested in these spaces of possibility and freedom, um, even if they're accessed through the negative rather than the positive. But I'm, I thoroughly believe that part of the intellectual function in this day and age should be to keep pursuing potentiality even as we see those spaces for, of potentiality quickly shutting down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, we always hope that the Italo lecture will stimulate a lot of discussion and dialogue and debate and questions uh, and follow-up questions. Um, uh, and, that, and, and I think it, it clearly achieved that this evening. So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you to everybody uh, for coming with your questions uh, and listening. Uh, there is a reception. We'd love for you to stay. Uh, and once again, uh, thank you to Professor Halberstam uh, for joining us, uh, and that closes this year's Atala lecture. <laughs>